the Beekeepers Guild. Since I am the president of the Philadelphia Beekeepers Guild, let me give you an introduction to this wonderful presenter we have tonight. Her name is Julia Mahoud. How do you know about her? Well, let me tell you. See, I am a beekeeper in Philadelphia and in California. And my <clears throat> because I was a beekeeper in California for about the last 10 or 12 years, I joined the local beekeeping club there, which is called the Mount Diablo Beekeepers Association. It is, I think, the largest local beekeeping club in America. Um, they have amazing meetings and back probably i think i think it was in february maybe or march they had a presentation on zoom that was done by this person named julia mahoud and it was in, on drone congregating areas which i knew i knew they were around but i had no idea what they were about or the details about them and this was one of the most amazing zoom presentations i had ever seen so after that I contacted the president of the Mount Diablo Beekeepers Association and asked her for contact information for Julia, communicated with her and asked her if she would be willing to speak to our guild. And she said, yes, she would. And we set up a date. And uh, so I invited her and she agreed to come, which is just awesome. Um, <clears throat> and I figured it would be important to have her come here because in Philadelphia, we have a good number of beekeepers and since we're in the city, it's almost unthinkable that you would have a drone congregating area in Center City, Philadelphia. But there are parks in Center City, near there anyway, um, Strawberry Mansion in that area. And there are places down by the river where there must be drone congregating areas because clearly the bees in Philadelphia do go and mate someplace. So I figured this would be a good thing for us to learn about in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so clearly, my recollection of her presentation is that she clearly knows a lot of stuff about bees and beekeeping. And um, <clears throat> I figured having her here would help me to kind of understand where my bees go out to mate and produce new queens and mate them um, in drone congregating areas, since I live right next to the city park. Um, and before she starts her presentation, I want to make one other comment and that is, two other comments. One is that last year she was, I think, the Georgia State Beekeeper of the Year, which is pretty impressive when you think about it. And also she does work at local prisons. And this is something that we have. I'm not sure we ever considered this in the Philadelphia Beekeepers Guild, but my impression is that this is something we should definitely think about in our area. I think that Justin may do this out in Chester uh, County, but I'm not really sure. So <clears throat> I leave the rest of it to her and uh, Chris or Dave. If you need to help her share her screen, I think that would be great. That's not something that I know how to do. So I will then pass this on to Dave and Chris and to Julia. Hi. Julie, we made uh, made you co-host. You should be able to share your screen now. Yeah, here I go. Yeah, and um, before we dump, jump in, I just want to make one quick announcement. Um, we're not going to, because of the, the heat emergency, um, we're not going to have uh, open the apiary this weekend. Um, so, so if anybody was planning on coming to the apiary this weekend, don't. Thank you. Sure, all right. Can you all see my screen? You're not seeing the presenter view, right? You're just seeing Game of Thrones, the drones with some bees. Awesome, awesome. So thanks for having me. That was a really sweet introduction, Morris. Um, I, uh, if you have been beekeeping for a while, you may have you may have heard that people say that the drones, which are the male bees, are like uh, shiftless and that they're lazy and that they're good for nothing. So, but, but they're, they're actually integral to the hive and they're really important. And so my goal here tonight is to educate you about drones and about their interesting drone congregation areas and how to find them. So um, if you have been disparaging of the male ones, hopefully by the end of the evening or at the end of my talk, you'll um, appreciate them a little bit more. In a thriving colony in the spring, you will see typically one queen, about 60,000 workers and a healthy colony 
and maybe about 6,000 drones, so many fewer drones than their sister workers. And in a lineup, the queen is definitely the tallest bee in the nest. The workers are, are shorter and lighter, but the drones are heavier than the queen, about a third more uh, weight to them. The biggest thing that's different about um, queens and drones, although sometimes new beekeepers, when they're looking for the queen, they'll point to a lot of drones and say, is that her? The drone's eyes are enormous. It looks like they touch in the middle. And the end of their abdomen is sort of blunt tipped like a cigar. It's not pointy like the women. So this is a photo of a drone and you see how it's blunt tipped abdomen compared to the workers and how big and his eyes are like they almost touch in the middle, um, unlike his sisters with the eyes are on the end. And because drones only live about 32 days, I do think that they always look like this in the hive. They're always young and hot looking and um, which helps fulfill their role in the nest. Before I talk about drones specifically, I wanna back up to some colony basics. In order for a colony to survive, they must be queen right. They have to have a queen, she's a mother of all the bees, and they also have to have workers. The queen can't care for brood or forage for resources, so the workers have to be there, and then they have to have food to eat. And these things are the bare minimum for survival of a single colony, but what about the colony as a superorganism. The superorganism is when there are individual organisms that have specialized behavior that together create one organism. And the honeybee superorganism is the colony. And if you think about humans, we need food, shelter, and water to survive as individuals. But as a species, we have to reproduce to survive. In a similar way, in order for the colonies, the superorganisms to reproduce, they need drones. And in the superorganism theory, it's like the, the colony is the unit and parts of them can correspond to organs and mammals. So the queen would be the ovaries, the worker's collective decision-making would be the brain, the comb is the liver. And in this theory, the drones are the flying testes of the superorganism. And I could have drawn that differently and I didn't, and you're welcome. So I'm sure you've all heard that it's really important for a colony to be queen, right? They have to have a queen. Well, it's also, important for them to be drone right. Um, they have a biological drive to raise these drones and to share their genetics, even though their queen's already mated and they're good and they don't want the queen to mate with, the, with her um, brothers anyway, they have this drive to share their genes. And what you always need to keep in mind is that colonies are not gonna raise drones if they can't afford them. If they come out of winter in distress, if they have low numbers or low food stores, they just won't raise drones. So it's really like a sign of prosperity if a colony can raise drones. If you'll let me indulge in some anthropomorphizing, I think of it like the workers have trophy husbands, like they're out there on the flowers boasting about how many drones they can support, because it's really a sign of a healthy thriving colony when you see lots of drones on it, for the most part. There's always an exception, right? So I'm thinking about lane workers, but I'll talk about that in a second. Back to the general thinking about how drones are drained on the colony for the average beekeeper. There was a really interesting study done in Scotland that compared colonies that were given drone comb at the beginning of the season as much as they freely able to produce as many drones as they wanted and those that, those that were restricted to only a worker-sized cell, cells and brood. And at the end of the season, the drone right colonies were larger and they actually made slightly more honey than the colonies that weren't, which is kind of mind-blowing. And also I have to mention that because beekeeping is never simple, there's another study done in Tom Seeley's lab that showed that colonies with, with lots of drone comb actually made less money. So you never know with, know with bees, but it's certainly not cut and dry. And we do know that for species survival, the colony needs its drones. The workers have the strong drive to raise them if they're thriving and can support them. Let's begin at the beginning. With drones, life begins in a proper cell. Drones are larger, and they need a bigger crib. What happens is every time a queen lays an egg, she puts her first puts her head in the cell and she feels that cell with her front legs. And that front that that uh, action tells her how big the cell is. And she pulls her head out, turns around, and serves her abdomen and lays an egg. And if she felt that the cell was small, if it was about four to five and a half millimeters, she's going to um, lay an egg. This egg comes out of her oviduct. And when it passes this little weird section called the valve fold, this some sperm from her spermatheca is going to be released. The spermatheca is the uh, gland and organ in her body where she has stored all the sperm that she collected on her mating flights. And that 
sperm stays viable. It's surrounded by this netting and it's got enzymes and it's oxygenated and it keeps the sperm healthy for, it can, for several years, which is crazy. So she really a bit of sperm to fertilize that egg and then she deposits it out her sting chamber into a cell. Now she reached in and felt that the cell was larger. If it was like six and six to seven millimeters, she, what happens is when that egg comes down, no sperm is released and she lays an unfertilized egg, which becomes a male. So the fertilized eggs become female and the unfertilized eggs become male. And the way we know that it's that front leg healing mechanism is because scientists cut the front legs off of queens and found that willy nilly, she would lay uh, fertilized and unfertilized eggs, no matter the cell size. So that is definitely the mechanism. Drones come from an unfertilized egg and they don't have fathers. They only have one set of chromosomes. And this is true of all hymenoptera bees and wasps. They're called haploids. Haploids just have one set of chromosomes. Workers and queens are diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes. And sex determination in bees is um, a little bit different than in humans. In humans, we have separate sex chromosomes and we have X's and Y's. And in honeybees, they have a complementary sex determinant gene and a sex determinant locus. And on this, in this gene, they have, there are different sex alleles. So I believe they found about 87 different sex alleles, but they believe that they're probably about 145. And some of the books you'll read that are that were published a while back will say that there's 17 or 11 sex alleles, but there are probably about 145. And what this means is uh, a queen will mate with a drone. And if, um, say, she's got a sex allele C and he's got a sex allele um, F. And if they, um, if that sperm fertilizes an egg, you have a heterozygous individual with two different alleles and then become a female. And as I mentioned, if she lays an egg and it doesn't get fertilized, it's only going to get one of her sex alleles. And so let's say it's just G and that'll become a male. But there is something that happens uh, called a homozygous individual, where if that queen mated with the drone and it fertilized an egg and they both had the, the uh, sex allele, say it's G, so if it was G and G, what you get is a male and they're known as diploid drones because it's a fertilized egg. But because that sex allele is the same, it becomes this diploid drone. Now diploid drones are smaller and they're infertile. And so you will never see them in the nest because when the workers, um, what when the, the nurse bees can smell, when those individuals hatch from an egg into a larvae, there are these cuticular compounds that they can smell and they gobble it up, they eat it. And so what you see is a, uh, it, as a bee, Keeper is this what we call shotgun brood pattern. So all of these eggs in here have been eaten. And so what you get is this spotty, spotty brood pattern. And incest is bad in the Game of Thrones and it's not good for bees. This colony is doomed because they um, have a queen that she either didn't mate with very many bees and one of them happened to be either related or she was just unlucky or she mated with a lot of her brothers. And as I mentioned, the workers eat them, nothing is wasted, it's protein, we gobble them up. Um, when I do bee talks to children's groups, sometimes I try to you know, talk about how you shouldn't be afraid of honeybees. They're gentle vegetarians, but that the wasps are carnivorous and they're more aggressive and um, you know, they're aggressive meat eaters. But the truth is that honeybees are gentle vegetarians when they're not being cannibals. Uh, I do wanna point out that if a queen mates with the books will tell you 12 to 20 drones, but Dave Tarpey's lab has dissected queens that had 50, 60, and 70 different drones that had mated with queens. So the number is probably a lot larger than we commonly think, um, a lot, a lot higher. So you might have a queen that mated with one of her brothers, but if she mated with 45 drones, then that's not a big deal. And you will see, you know, not this many, but in a solid frame of brood. You might see an open cell here or there, and that's either perhaps she mated with one brother or one related drone, or it's hygienic behavior, and they're pulling it opening and pulling out those larvae because of mites. So it's, it's really nothing to worry about unless it looks like this. The drones you'll see in your hives are haploids because, um, and by the way, we know that they, that those diploid drones are lower in weight and that they're infertile because they've raised them in labs. You can't make uh, bees lay them, but when, uh, raise them. But when you raise them in, raise them in an incubator, they have um, 
you know, discovered what happens. The germs that you'll see in your labs are haploids, and because they only have one set of chromosomes, occasionally you'll see a recessive gene expressed. The dominant eye color in honeybees is black, but occasionally you'll see, um, you'll see eye color that's different. You'll see these tan, these beige, and cherry red color eyes. And then sometimes you'll see these white adrenals, which is human here. Um, these were in a teaching egg berry that I found this summer. And what's cool about this is you, even their little ocelli are white. Isn't that crazy? Um, sadly, the white adrenals are blind, so they never get a mate. And it doesn't mean that your queen's unhealthy. It just means that she has a recessive gene for eye color and it gets expressed when she lays drones. So we have haploid drone eggs in larger cells. And the first learning about bees, you might've been taught that all larvae are fed royal jelly for the first few days, right? Well, it's a tad more complicated than that. The three different types of bees are fed, fed three different jellies. There's of course royal jelly for the queen. Workers get worker jelly and drones get drone jelly. It's not that different. It just has to do with the ratio of the, the, what's called the clear food and the white food. But the biggest difference in the drone food is that they are bigger bees and they need more food. Not unlike teenage boys. I raised two boys and if you have any, you know how much they can eat. These are kind of like that. In a similar way to the requirement of workers where they get uh, more bee bread, pollen mixed with honey toward the end of their larval period. Drones also get more pollen and honey at the end of their larval period. You're probably all familiar with this type of chart that shows that everybody is an egg for three days. And then the workers, the, the workers and the queens have a, about the similar larval period, about five to six days. The drones, however, they have a longer larval period and they have a much longer pupil period. And it takes them 24 days to emerge, whereas workers it's 21 and queens it's 16. But an interesting thing is that these numbers are not set in stone. And there can actually be quite a range. Uh, it can take drones, they can emerge as fast as 20 days, workers can come out in 16. The queens pretty much stick around right around day 16, but it can also take a lot longer. It can take almost a month for drones to come out and 24 days for workers. And there are two factors that affect this, and that is temperature and food. So if it's cool and they're not getting fed enough jelly during those and um, breed bread during the larval period, it might take them longer, or if they're getting a lot and it's really warm, it could take them a shorter time to emerge. And these two factors, food temperature and food, uh, them getting them probably have a lot to do with their location in the nest. If you give bees an empty frame and let them make their own comb, they're amazing little architects. And what they will do is make smaller cells in the center where they will raise workers. And then the cells will get a little larger as they go out and they'll, the queen will lay drones on the periphery of the, the worker nest. And then of course, they'll store honey, honey and pollen in the corners. Now think about this for a second, temperature and food. If you're sitting in a restaurant, when you're sitting in the middle, you're probably more likely to get your coffee refill than if you're over in the corner by the bathroom. And if it's cold in the nest, who's gonna take the hit at night? So say it's a spring day and the, there's lots of drone brood in the colony and the temperatures really dip at night, the drones are the ones that are going to um, suffer from the heat. And in kind of a cool way, the drones are provide insulation to their more important worker sisters, which is kind of cool if you think about it. The survival rate for drones is in the nest is much lower than workers. A worker's chance for, to make it from egg to adult is about 85% survival. And for drones, it's only 55%. So about 55% of those eggs that are laid are not going to make it to adulthood. If you use all worker foundation, what you'll find, especially in the springs, that you'll pull out a frame and you find this drone comb that's been made in between the boxes, right? And that's because they are just desperate to raise their drones. They really want to um, raise them and they'll take any chance they can get. You will also sometimes find that they will make, uh, they will raise drones on your worker foundation, but they just make the cells stick out more. And this is okay, but it's really not, your, your drones are gonna be smaller and there are, there's a lot of proof that shows that bigger drones are better. They have more sperm and they can fly better. So you really want to give your bees the opportunity to make bigger drones. This is a foundation of the spring where you can see the smaller worker brood in the middle. And then this is the drone brood at the top and around the bottom. It looks like bubble wrap. It's pretty easy to tell the difference. The worker brood is flat and this looks like bubble wrap. 
drone rearing generally happens during a nectar flow, but at all times, the colony's constantly evaluating where to put their resources. And if they're raising a lot of brood, whether it's drone or worker, and conditions change, say there's a cold snap or it gets rainy and windy and the food stops coming in, then the workers are going to curb the amount of brood they are raising by eating the eggs larvae. And sometimes they'll even uncap and pull out pupae and eat them. And the, the term for this cannibalism is called brood trimming. And workers trim the brood by eating it, kind of like they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when, uh, when there's a diploid draft. But sometimes um, in a small colony, there isn't, aren't enough workers and not enough nurse bees to raise brood. Like you get a brand new queen and you've got this small colony or a nuke that you just split off and the queen's ready to go and you go in and you see it frame after frame of eggs and you come back the next week and you still see eggs. You don't, you know, she's still laying, but you don't see cat brood. And that's because it takes a lot of workers to raise this brood. And so what they're going to do is just they're going to eat the eggs that they can't nurse along and eventually they'll catch up. But uh, at any time, like, you know, say there's a cold snap, like I mentioned, or something happens, they will engage in this behavior. And what's fascinating to think about for just a second is what kind of feedback loops are going on in the nest that one worker knows it's okay to eat these eggs? And you know, how does she know what her sister is doing? And it's just one of those things that makes, that blows your mind that bees are able to, um, to function as this incredible superorganism. This is, uh, we'll talk about the drone schedule. Once he does emerge, they emerge fully formed with all the equipment they need, but they're still developing in the first week or two after emergence and they're not ready for their one job. So on day one, their cuticle is hardening and they can't fly. And that's true of workers too. They're just kind of walking around, stiffening up and, um, and they can't fly. On the, the first week, drones are primarily fed by nurse bees and they feed them the regurgitated contents of their stomach that has a lot of protein in it. Later in life, the drones just need carbs, but for, their, um, for them to develop sexually, they really need that high protein diet, which is fed by nurse bees. But sometimes you'll read that uh, drones can't feed themselves, like they're so pathetic, but they, they can actually feed themselves. They just, it's, it's sort of uh, healthier for them to, to be fed by the workers, but I've seen them um, crawl out and drink honey and they can definitely do it. But after about a week, they are primarily fed by nurse bees. I mean, by, by drinking honey from cells. For the first 12 days, their reproductive organs are maturing. They come into the world with everything they need, their sperm uh, and their testes, but it has to migrate to the seminal vesicles, and then it has to mature while it's there. So that's kind of going on for at least 12 days. Around days, day eight or so, they go on their first flights and they are cleansing and orientation flights, just like workers do. They go out to fly in low, slow circles and memorize their neighborhood so they know how to get home. And starting on day 12 is when they can make their first attempts at mating flights, because at that point they are begin to be sexually mature. Drones have one job and very few of the drones raised are going to get to fulfill the ultimate destiny, and that is to mate with queens from other colonies. We're going to look next at how drones are equipped for their one job and how they're different from workers. Compared to workers, drones are kind of um, lacking in many ways. They have tiny mandibles. You know, if you think about it, they don't need to be scraping propolis or uh, carrying big things around. They just have to be able to uncap a honey cell. So they're kind of small. They have a short proboscis. They don't need a long tongue like workers to mine nectar out of flowers. They just sit out of the honey cells. So their proboscis is about three millimeters and workers is like six or seven. They don't have pollen collecting structures on their legs and they have a slender crop. They don't need that multi tubered stomach like workers have because they're not making honey. And they don't have wax, hypopharyngeal, or nasonal glands. What makes them really fun to work with is they don't have a sting gland. They can't sting you. And so it makes them fun to work with. If you want to, like, if you have some friends over who aren't beekeepers and you want to impress them, you can take a couple of drones and put them up inside your veil and be like, oh, it's no big deal, you know, I have these on my face. So now we're going to look at how the drones are equipped to carry out their one job. The drones antenna have 10 times the olfactory plates of workers. I'm sure you all know that the antenna are the noses of the bee. And we all know how incredibly well workers can smell, right? Because they are hovering, you know, eight meters off the ground and they have to be able to smell the flowers that are blowing. Think about how drones can smell 10 times better. They have to be able to smell queens 
flying in the drone foundation area. So it's an incredible sense of smell and they have an extra segment on their flagellum. They have much larger compound eyes. Again, they have to spot those queens in the DCAs when they're flying. So they have more facets in their optic lobes. So their brains are much larger to process all that information coming on their eyes. Their mandibles, though they be tiny, they do produce pheromones. And those pheromones in the DCA um, act as a, an attractant. So the other drones know that they're, they've arrived, sort of like walking into a bar and smelling beer and peanuts. And they're probably also that cues the queens to know that they're in DCAs. They have larger flight muscles and broader wings because their, their job is to um, fly. And uh, so they, they have to be able to um, fly really well because they fly in the DCAs. The thorax does create heat for the brood nest. So this is the one thing that drones do besides go on the flights that they do to contribute to the colony. They vibrate their thorax thoraces and that generates heat on the brood nest. And they've shown that workers can kind of signal the, the drones um, to start shaking and they dent their thoraxes, thoraces produce more heat than workers. So they do have one job. It's kind of like that kid, you know, at least he makes his bed. He may not have all the mountain but he does contribute a little bit. So if anybody says that drones are total, um, totally lazy, you can tell them that fun fact. And do y'all know what this is? This is a slide of bees mating in the sky. And it's light because it is literally impossible to see with the naked eye. Honeybees are unique in their mating behavior. They mate on the wing while they're flying 13 to 15 miles an hour. And because of this, it's been really difficult to study. You cannot make honeybees mate in a lab. They just won't do it. The same drone and queen, when they're put together on, on the ground, show no interest in each other. And then a few meters in the air, they will show interest in each other. Um, because of mating on the wing and because the drone's reproductive organs are all internal, people hundreds of years ago used to think that perhaps bees didn't mate at all, They're just some sort of magical chaste reproduction animal. But when researchers were able to attach kites, blue kites to queens, so they could track them with the movie camera and really watch what's happening, that's when it became much more clear uh, exactly what happens when bees mate. Oops, did I miss something? Oh, no, okay. Honeybees, um, so they mate in areas called drone congregation areas, or DCAs for short. These are areas about 30 to 200 meters in diameter where drones from many different colonies gather together and fly around looking for queens to mate with. And while they're flying around, as I mentioned earlier, their ears can with that mandibular pheromone. And drones from one colony will visit different DCAs at the same time. And any one individual drone will visit several DCAs in the same day, sort of like bar hopping. They could even go um, up to several DCAs in one flight. They can fly for an average of 30 minutes before they have to go back home and refuel. So depending on how, how far they're going and how hot it is. So before they leave the nest, they, they gorge on honey and fill up their honey stomach. And then they clean their eyes and clean their antennas. So it's kind of like you know, getting all dolled up. And then they head out for a flight. And they go on these flights in the afternoons. Sometimes in some books you'll read 12 to three or one to four, but it really depends on the, uh, the area that you're in. Where I'm in, in Georgia, because it gets hotter, um, they really don't fly until later in the day. They fly from three to seven. There's a DCA that I'll go in at two o'clock and it'll have nobody and I come back at three and there's thousands of bees. Be, which makes it kind of interesting to study. I talked to a woman who did her PhD work at the University of Florida and she studied drone congregation areas and she said she almost gave up because she wasn't finding any because she was going by what the books say and was regarding these studies done in Germany where it's much cooler than Florida and down there she doesn't see them until three either. But the funny thing is I would see drones flying at one o'clock out of the nest. So I don't know if they're just early and there's really not enough there or if they're taking orientation flights or what but time of day is a um, factor. And the thing that's so cool about DCAs is they are mysterious. They, um, they remain constant year after year, but drones get kicked out in the fall. They're only raised during the spring and summer and a little bit of the fall when there are queens to mate with. And then at that point, they're really not needed anymore and they are drain on resources. The whole point of the colony is to survive winter and they can't do that if, um, if they've got bees sitting around that are just gobbling up honey. So they kick them out. So there's no 
intergenerational learning and even during the summer where they do overlap, we know that drones don't do dances or any kind of communication in the house. But there's a DCA that is known to have bees in it since in Sheffield, England since 1722, which is crazy. And they've done things like there was a really cool study where they marked every drone in a couple colonies with paint on their backs. And overnight, they drove them several hundred kilometers away and then to a new apiary where they kept them closed up until they got into the DCAs and they were ready there with the traps and they opened the entrances and the drones were being trapped in the DCAs within 15 minutes. So somehow they knew where to go, which is craziest. Crazy, craziest. I don't know what that means. So there are some, some cues, clues about DCAs that you will read about in the literature. They, these tend to head towards depressions in the landscape. So if they fly out of their nest and there's uphill or downhill, they're gonna cho choose downhill most of the time. And there are also visual cues that they use to navigate. So they might fly along a tree line or a river or something like that. You will read that they like to mate where there's a windbreak. So an open area lined with trees. And there's a theory that uh, proposed by Gerald Loper that he thinks that DCAs occur where there's magnetic anomalies in the earth. We know that honeybees workers will use magnetic fields to orient if the other options are, are excluded from them. And all honeybees have iron particles in their abdomens that the workers and drones. So that's definitely a possibility. It's just really difficult to study. When a drone leaves, he's gonna take certain paths to get to DCA. So he's gonna fly out and then uh, hit, hit the DCA and fly up higher in the air in spirals and then come back down and maybe head to another one. And on the right, this is a picture of a, a map that Jerry Loper did this study in Arizona, which was really cool. They used x band radar to see the DCAs. And because in Arizona, it's, you know, it's scrubby. There's not big hardwood trees like there are um, in your part of the world and mine. So they were able to do this and, and map things out. And it showed that they did follow some geographic cues. You know, the dots for the DCAs and then the lines are the flyways. This is, I hope y'all can see this on Zoom. These are a couple of videos of DCAs and um, I'm gonna use my, my cursor to show you where the, what happens is the drones, when they smell a queen in the area, they are going to line up in sort of comets and fly behind her and chase her so that they can chase each other. So hopefully you'll be able to see this and I'll point to where some of them line up. And this is right here, see that? And then they kind of line up and then, then they disperse, which is kind of cool to see. So I don't know that they were chasing queens here. They could have been because this trap has queen pheromone on it. Queen, when queen pheromone is in the air, they'll chase anything they see. So it could have been a dragonfly or something flying through. And this is just another video. Again, it's on cloud so you can see the uh, the comments a little bit better. I hope y'all are able to see that. You'll have to tell me if I'm a bit left. I never know this one. Now, given the opportunity, bees will mate in the flyways, but inbreeding is not good for honeybees, just like it's not good in, in the Game of Thrones. So some really interesting mechanisms have evolved with honeybees to keep them, to keep inbreeding to a minimum. What happens is when workers and queens leave the nest, they tend to fly up about eight meters high and head out on their way. The drones, however, head up about 26 meters high, which happens to be about tree height of uh, a hardwood tree. So they head out at, at about this height, and when they get to the DCA, they can fly up to 75 meters above ground, spiral back down, head them on the way. Now, because queens are way outnumbered by drones, like thousands to one, chances are min most drones that go to the DCA are not going to get to meet with the queen. So they tend to stay closer to home. So they go out, they fly for a while, and they have to come back home and eat and head out again. However, a queen, when she gets to a DCA, it only takes literally seconds to mate. So she's gonna have time to fly farther away because when she gets to a DCA, there will be plenty of males there for her to choose from. So she can afford to fly farther away. And because she's flying lower and her brothers are flying higher, there's less, they're less likely to mate and fly, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. And I used to have on here that this was about a third of a mile and that the queens would fly a mile away, but it, it totally has to do the distance with the saturation of colonies in your area. The drones too like to be close close to home, and they, it can be as little as you know two or three hundred um, 
uh, feet. Honeybee copulation is a complicated thing. And already I've mentioned that it's done mid-flight on the go on about 12 to 15 miles an hour. So a queen has found a DCA because of her strong pheromones, she attracts this comet of drones chasing her and the, the fastest one who's in the front is gonna get to meet with her first. And what they do is they approach her from below and once contact made is made, it takes like literally a second. So the drone is gonna um, grab her with his first four legs. And at that point, the queen has to open her sting chamber. She doesn't open her sting chamber, they don't mate. We really have no idea what makes her do this or, or not do it. But I like to say that honeybees figured out consent a long time before humans did. So let's say she opens her sting chamber, then his endophallus, which is this, this complicated mating organ, actually everts into her. So it doesn't um, just come out, it, it sort of unfolds. So think about if you had a, took off a nitrile glove, everybody knows what those are now. Take off your nitro glove and have your, your fingers kind of stay in, inside and then you blow on it to make them come out. That's kind of what happens with the endophallus. It everts. So this action ruptures his abdomen. His endophallus takes up about two thirds of his abdomen anyway. It ruptures, it, it everts in there. It's, this action paralyzes him, snaps him backward, and he falls to his death. There are no drones that may can possibly fly back to the nest. And the end of his endophallus separates. You'll hear people say it breaks off. It's not that violent. It's, it's designed to constructed to, to separate. And the piece of endophallus that remains in her is called it, the mating sign. And sometimes about 70% of the time when the queens return to the nest, you can see the endophallus of the last one she mated with. When they mate and the mates, it takes one second. And it makes, sometimes there's an audible popping noise and that you can hear from the ground if they're low enough. So it makes a popping noise, takes a second, the next drone, drone lines up. His endophallus, this complicated organ, actually has these little hairs that point downward and the mounting action will pull the previous mating sign out of the queen so that his endophallus can go in. And then he mates with her. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the books say 12 to 20 but really upwards of 50 drones is not uncommon. And the more drones you can mate with, mates with, the healthier your colony is gonna be because that genetic diversity brings all kinds of qualities that are important for a healthy colony. So the more is definitely the better. Drones that don't get lucky and die will fly around for half an hour, come back, drink a bunch of honey and set out again and visit you know, several different DCAs. But if mating doesn't kill him, the workers eventually will, as I mentioned earlier. The resources are scarce and they're dirt. So not only at the end of the season, but if the resources are scarce and they just can't feed him anymore, they will refuse them entrance. And drones are notorious for drifting. They do drift a lot from colony to colony. Because interestingly, bird bees at other colonies, they don't care if drones come in, unless they're really struggling. They just let them in. But Again, by the by the end of the fall, um, there aren't any drones left in the colony typically. What I want to encourage you all to do is to make room for your drones. They are really integral to the colony and can help. And I want to share a few tips for making that happen. You might be familiar with this green drone uh, frames that are totally made out of plastic and they're embossed with drone size cell to make big, healthy drones. They come in medium and shallow sizes and they're really made for a type of world control which I'll talk about in a second but you can if you choose to use these it's nice because you can spot them pretty easily you know where your drone comb is if you use these you definitely want to coat them with some wax though they they'll in the springtime they're more likely to build on it but they're going to really take to it if you can paint them with some wax but you don't even have to buy this fancy green comb if you use deeps you can put a medium or shallow frame in into your deep pot body and they will happily build out drone comb in the bottom. And when I was talking earlier about uh, hygienic behavior, or maybe the queen just made it with one relative, this is a pretty good brood pattern just to have here and there open cells. It's probably hygienic behavior, but it could be a little bit of inbreeding. And the other thing is you don't even have to do this. If you have a deep frame and you just completely remove the foundation, so long as you put it between two frames of brood, not honey, but brood. So in your brood box, just pop that foundation out, put it between. They will gladly be build out the big cells if it's in the springtime. 
and they'll fill it with drones. What's interesting is later as the, as the summer progresses, when they don't need to raise as many drones, they're gonna use those big cells to store honey, which is more efficient and also kind of cool. Now, some of you are thinking, but Julia, we know that drones are more likely to raise, uh, have mites reproducing those cells. And, th and that's true. Interestingly, the varroa mite evolved with Apis serrana, the Eastern honeybee. And because they evolved together, they don't kill Apis serrana. They just, they're just sort of something that lives within the colony. And in Apis serrana, they only reproduce in drone brood, never in worker brood, which is probably one of the ways they keep it in check. But Roa are, have evolved this behavior probably because drones take those extra few days to pupate. And in that time, they can produce another mite or two. And they can smell the difference between worker brood and drone brood. So if drone brood is available, they're going to hop in there to reproduce. And as Varroa control, what, what these frames, frames are made for is you raise drones, and once it's capped, you take the frame out, put it in the freezer. It will kill the mites. It also kills the drones. You can put it back in because everything's dead. The workers will uncap it and the queen can lay again and you can kind of keep doing that. And it really does work. I did a study at Georgia Tech last summer where we were raising drones in the incubator and the, the, the mite population, and this is actually when I took this picture in the author, but that was towards the end of the summer. The mite population definitely went up as the season went on and I would have to pick the mites off these poor fellows. But what I noticed the first time I had like a lot of mites on the bees coming out of the incubator was I went back home and where the colony that the frames came out of and did a mite count and the mite count remained low. So the, the drone brood was really trapping the varroa and none of those colonies ever reached the treatment threshold. But what I would encourage you to do, rather than just take those frames and freeze them, is to use your capping scratcher. This is a great little tool. What you can do is just push that in, that little forky thing in to a section of the cap drones and pull the pupae out and look at them. And if they're riddled with mites, absolutely pop it in the freezer, no question about it. But if they're not, if I'm in a big chunk, you only see one mite or two, or you don't see any, then I would leave it in the colony and let them raise those drones to maturity. Because drones can't sting you, another fun thing to do with drones is to practice queen marking with them. So, you know, that. It, you know, it's, it's so stressful to mark queens. I kind of hate it myself, but I do it. You want to just hold them by the thorax, and so and if you squeeze their abdomen, you could really damage them. So this can be a fun club activity for you to do. Get try to get some young drones out of a colony in the spring, and you all can practice marking them. Pesticides are bad. I'm sure you all know that. The neonicotinoids, which are the systemic pesticides, there have been studies done that show that um, exposure to neonics makes drone, makes drone sperm count 39% lower. This is really bad news for your colonies. You don't want your queens to mate with a bunch of drones that are infertile. It's, it's not good for your colony either. So please watch your pesticide use. I'm a fan of this organization, Pollinator Stewardship Council, that supports um, fighting pesticide use in the industry, uh, in, the, in the agricultural industries. But you also can look at your home products that you use. You know, they kind of sneak some of that stuff in and call it like there's like a feed for roses that has new mix in it. You have to read the labels really carefully. You can even buy plants that are treated with new mix. So it's in every um, part of the plant from like Home Depot and big box stores. So you definitely want to read the tags on those plants that you buy. Okay, so how do you find your drone congregation areas? The way that people have found drug propagations for the most part in the past is to use a helium filled weather balloon. So this is a weather balloon and it looks tiny up there, but it's really five feet in diameter. And this is my buddy Courtney and she's holding kite string and attached to the bottom of the weather balloon is a little bit of queen pheromone. And we were walking around, this method takes two people, I'm back where the camera is with binoculars, looking to see if I can see any bees flying around this weather balloon. And this was done on a clear, still day, like a perfect day in the afternoon. We, we walked around all afternoon. And as you can see, this is an open area lined by trees. So I went and looked on Google Maps for what you see in the textbooks, which is an open area lined by trees, and uh, didn't see a single bee. And we walked around that thing for like an hour. Then we went to a neighbor's yard that has sort of a, the same situation, a really big open area lined by trees, nothing. And then we went to a parking lot that had a tall building. Again, providing windbreak, open area, saw nothing. It's really depressing. 
And filling up a healing balloon, helium is a finite resource, and there's actually a worldwide helium shortage now. It costs like 100 bucks to fill up that helium balloon, that weather balloon. So I went home that night. I was kind of bummed. And I told my husband, well, I'll just keep looking for as many days as the helium holds out. But the next day, the balloon was dead on the ground. So I thought, there's got to be a better way. There, there's another way that researchers look for DCAs, and that is to do the same thing with the lore, but hold a really tall pole. But again, that's, you know, there, that's not that easy to do, if you're, especially if you're walking around in any kind of an urban area, because, you you know, there's, there's power lines and stuff you have to get around. And it's also hard on your body to hold a pole up like that for a really long time. And the other obvious thing is there are, there's, both of these methods assume that the drones are going to be in this with an area that you can walk under. These cannot be used to survey land over trees. So remember that. I worked on, so I, I worked on this method to find drones using a mechanical drone and it can be confusing. So when I say drone, I'm talking about these fuzzy handsome fellows here. And when I talk about the mechanical drone, I'm going to call it a UAV for unmanned aerial vehicle. So I got a UAV and um, tried a few different ways to attach the lure. What I think works really well is to use thin cotton thread to tie to the feet here, and then it dangles down, and you want something to attach your lure to, lure to that has a little bit of heft to it just so it stays down, but not too much so that it creates a pendulum. And also this helps your camera up here know, you know what you see where the lure is. You want to use thin cotton string, not something strong like fishing on them because if your lure happens to get caught on a tree or a bush, you want the thread to break and you lose your lure rather than crash your very expensive UAV. Lure is not very expensive compared to UAV. So that's what I recommend. For lure, this product looks great. It's called Temp Queen. And what it's made for, it's artificial queen mandibular pheromone that's impregnated these little green strips. And if you had a queenless colony and you were had ordered a queen or you, you know, we're gonna have to wait a week or two to, to get a queen. This will keep your colony from producing lane workers. It's enough pheromone for that. And it works great in this application. They sell it at Man Lake and at Better Be. And I'm not sure one of them has a multi-pack that might be good if some people in your club wanted to, y'all wanted to blend together, or you can just buy a few strips. It'll keep in the freezer for weeks or, or for months, actually. It'll keep for a really long time. So I just get mine out when I go look for DCAs and then I roll it up and keep it in the freezer and it's fine. One thing you can use to attach your lure tour is lure two is a hair roller. You just peel out the fuzzy elevator, these plastic hair rollers, and you attach the lure with zip tie and you can see my thread on there. You want something that weighs about seven to 10 grams. A uh, friend of mine said, you know, Julia, she just wanna buy, I wanna buy a bunch of hair rollers I don't need. So she just got a prescription pill bottle and drilled some holes in it and it works great. So that's certainly another option if you don't want to buy a bunch of rollers. At first, I was worried about the, sweat, the wind from the propellers, the wash, flooding the area with cream and dibble pheromone and, you know, artificially. Like, I wanted it to be as natural as it would be if there's a queen. So I flew my UAV over my head very slowly until I couldn't feel the wash on my face. And that distance on my UAV was about 20 feet. So I try to make my string at least... 22 feet from the lure whenever possible. I've since found that it really doesn't matter about, I've actually tried to uh, churn up the air and create a VCA and you, you can't do it artificially, but there's another reason for making your string long, which I'll mention in just a second. Now, where to look? What I recommend is you use Google Earth Pro, which is different from Google Maps, it's free though. And you go in here and you go into preferences and there's this tool called elevation exaggeration. And you bump it up to the maximum, which is three, and then when you go back to the map, you can, you can put in the address of your apiary and you can kind of move out along the land and it shows any little depression, it makes it like a huge drop off. And I personally have had luck with kind of going out along the landscape and then where there's a dip, even if it's just like a house on, on a moderate hill, at the bottom of the dip, I have found some DCAs. And then in lower areas like where creek beds. Time of day is important, as I mentioned, you might think, oh, well, you know, I see drones flying, it's one o'clock, but they might not be out there yet. So what I recommend is find a few spots you think are possible, go to one, fly in it. If you think that, uh, if, if, you, if it's a DCA, you're gonna see drones within five minutes, you'll know. 
So you can fly for five minutes one place, drive to another location, five minutes, and keep going around and come back to the original one. You have about three locations. And that way you, you kind of covered the your time options. This was a, I, I zoomed in on a picture I took when I, I thought I'd found a DCA, I was so excited. But as you can see, there are only like 10, you know, tens of drones on the lure means that you're in a flyway. So it's still great information, but it's not a true DCA. A true DCA is gonna have hundreds of drones, if not thousands flying on the lure. And this is a video uh, shot in an area where, see the, so this is why the long string comes in handy. There's this long string, and then see these little white specks. They're gonna move in a minute if, if the video quality works great. And you'll also see some bigger bees closer to the UAV. The drones are attracted for some reason to the, to the UAV itself. They almost act like it's defensive behavior because they're flying into this wind in the propeller. And I will warn you that you will chop up a couple bees in your, in your fly, but it's not a lot. And, um, but they are, they, they throw themselves at the UAV, which is crazy. So you can kind of see how they line up and trail around each other down near the lure. And you can also see the bees flying up closer to the camera. So this was done, this video was taken in August. This DCA is even more popular than in the spring. And I hope this doesn't make you nauseated. So I'll turn around a little bit. And in a second, you'll see a street. But notice one thing, notice what this is over. Is this an open area? Not, no, there was that one little bit of yard, but this is primarily over a tree canopy. And this road that you're gonna see in one second is, um, see that busy road? This is the next lot down was actually that soccer field where I was with the healing blink. And I flew my UAV at that soccer field like a hundred times because it's just supposed to be textbook VCA, but it wasn't. The tree canopy adjacent to it was. And then I mentioned earlier that I went to the neighbor's backyard. That tree line adjacent to that yard was a DCA, but I cannot get any of the bees to follow my drone, my UAV, excuse me, over into the yard. It's crazy. So what I personally am finding in the Atlanta area where it means there's a lot of trees is that that open area with the windbreak doesn't really compute. And I also see the drones flying up to 400 feet in the air. So the windbreak thing is not necessarily true. I think when they were, you know, when you're doing research and you're holding a pole and they come down low, that you just can't get the scope of how, how where else that they fly. So I don't think that that's necessarily the case. There's not my experience. So this is my citizen science project. It's a website called mapmydca.com. It's totally free for anyone to use. And my idea here is to collect drone congregation area locations. And on the website, you can read about drones, about DCAs. I outline my method using the UAV to find DCAs. So if you click you know, on about drones, you can read all about that stuff. And then back to the homepage, if you click on view the DCA map, you're going to see this. It's a Google map with a special Google map. And where you see red dots are places where people have pinned DCAs that they found. So if you zoom in over the Atlanta area, you're going to see some DCAs that I've pinned. And if you roll over one of the red pins, this details window pops up. You click on it. And you can read the information that the user chose to add. And notice at the bottom, it says YouTube video is like, so I have, if, if you were having trouble seeing that video because of the internets um, and Zoom's limitations, you are welcome to go look at some videos on the website because I have all the ones I've found posted. Most of the information, I mean, it's optional for the users to put in, but um, my hope is that eventually the map will fill up with lots of locations and, you know, we have these, Google Maps is always coming out with new tools. So there might be a better way to assess where drone migration areas are other than the, the more limited data that we have from past research. Anyone who wants to can download the data, it's totally free. One thing I don't address on the website is how to use a UAV. It's, a, it's not only an expensive piece of equipment, but it's, they don't have to be expensive, but they can be dangerous. I mean, if you crash one in the street, you could cause an accident, you don't want that to happen. So you don't need to educate yourself on how to use one responsibly. I don't know about in Philadelphia, but in Georgia, the law says that you 
can legally fly over private property so long as your feet are on public property. So I can stand in the street and fly over somebody's house um, that I would, I'm within my legal right, but it might not be well received. So we always have to be good ambassadors and speakers, right? Because we have to educate people about staying and stuff. And um, uh, I'll just tell you a little story about one time I was flying in a cul de sac. I was only like a mile from my house. And I was about done for the day. I hadn't found anything. And this pickup truck pulls up, and this guy, there's no hello or anything. He's like, What are you doing? And I said, Oh, you know, hi, I'm actually doing some honey research. Um, but uh, I don't want to bother you. And, and I'm pretty much done anyway. So I land on my way to you. I'm like, I'll be on my way. And he's like, what do you mean honey research? And I told him a little bit about it. And as people will do, he said, oh, well, I know a beekeeper. And I said, yeah, who do you know? Maybe I know them. He said, oh, no, you don't know. She doesn't live in Atlanta. She lives up in coming. I know it's in kayaking. And I said, oh, I bet that's Kelly Campbell. And he was like, oh, yeah, it is Kelly. Um, so before I left, he, you know, after talking to him, I asked, asked, you, asked me to find my drone back up and take a picture of his house and email it to him. But before I traveled that one mile from my home to my home, I got a text message from my friend Kelly Campbell, who sent me a screenshot of the conversation she had with this guy, where he said, some bee lady was flying a drone over house today, saying she was looking for male honeybees zooming over my treetops, WTF. She said she knew you, so I figured she had to be cool, so I didn't shoot her. So I live in Georgia, where people love their guns, but even, uh, even without the threat of uh, ammo, just be respectful and be aware and, you know, whenever you can ask permission and just, you know, always have a smile on your face and be willing to land in UAV if you um, meet any kind of negativity. This is the end of my talk. I have some references here. If there were anything that you all wanted to look up, you're welcome to take a picture of that. You can follow me on the things I post on Instagram and Facebook occasionally. And that's the website, mapmydca.com, and my email, which you're welcome to take, or you can always send a contact from the website to ask me any questions. And I'm also um, can take questions now. All right, Julia, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Uh, since I'm the boss, I will ask you the first question. And that is, does the queen make any selection of the sperm that she uses to fertilize her eggs? Or does it just come out randomly? That's a great question. The sperm from the, in the spermathega comes out randomly. But one thing I didn't really um, make clear was that each, each drone has three to 11 million sperm in his, uh, to offer. And the spermathega can hold about 6 million sperm. But she's mating with, you know, 20 to 50 drones. So what happens is, and she's gonna have, she's gonna be bloated with sperm when she comes back. And over a few days, the spermathec will sort of sip up little bits of each drone sperm. So she has a nice mixture in her spermatheca. There is, I heard about something, I was told something, but I haven't been able to track it down that the scutellata, you know, we call them killer bees here, that their sperm, for some reason, when a queen starts laying, she will first use the scutellata sperm. So we don't know if they pull at the opening, but again, I haven't been able to track down that research. Every other thing that I've read says that it's pretty evenly mixed. So she's going to lay, um, her eggs are going to be fertilized with a pretty good mix of the germs that she makes it with. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Questions are free. I have a question. Um, it seems to me that sometimes you do see drones in the winter cluster. Is that is that a hard and fast rule? As okay. is that you know, the only hard and fast rule in beekeeping? Is they they kick them all out? You know, it's a hard and fast rule. Every time I get this talk, somebody says, "I've seen a drone in the winter." <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it depends somewhat on the race of the bee, on the subspecies. I've heard that Russians keep more drones in the nest. You will see one or two, and I think they just tell good jokes. I mean, there's no really no real reason for it <laughs> biologically. Uh, I find that in my bees, I hardly ever see any. It's typically, you know, when I get in there, like in February when we have a 70 degree day, I don't see any, but it really probably has to do with the subspecies and the genetics of your bees, but people do, do see them. Well, they all say that it's it's when resources get short and and sometimes 
the hives don't get short. They have plenty of resources. And those are the hives that I have seen the, you know, where I've keep seen them okay. keep them around. And I have had, I have, I have not bought Russians recently, but I have had them in my apiary. So I probably uh, have some of that. You probably have that genetics in your area. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have a question? I think there's a couple in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do we know the oh. species of drones by their color? I have a large white drones and round drones. So what's interesting about drones is because they are come from an unfertilized egg, they're only going to get half of the queen's um, genetics. So that you will see um, different color drones based because she has, you know, she's she's got 32 chromosomes and only 16. But I think it's not quite as is clear cut as when you workers, you know, carnelians are kind of gray colored. I have seen, um, sometimes you'll see drones that are completely black, like absolutely no brown on them. They're really cool looking. But I, I think that they are less easy to ID by phenotype than workers because they only have half the chromosomes, so you might see a difference. Mm -hmm. And somebody wrote for insulation. Oh, that was just when you were saying, why would a drone be? seen in the winter and I just thought that was really interesting that you, when you were showing the pattern um, that they might be you know on the outside partly for insulation well that would be their brood and that would be like an early like late winter when the queen just starts laying a little bit right here we're talking about adult bees but they also do provide that you know they vibrate that thorax and generate heat so maybe they put them to work it seems like that would be a useful skill in the winter Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, they have to eat honey to generate that heat, but can they, can they also disconnect their wings from the from their muscles like the worker bees can to shiver in the winter? I think the shivering is a similar, you know, where they expand and contract those muscles. Right. So it's, it's the same as workers, yeah. But they make their, their heat that they generate is a little bit higher in temperature, which is interesting. And they're bigger. They're hot guys. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I missed this, but um, the, the queen, the, the, the different kinds of sperm mix in the sperm, they can come out randomly. But does the queen have any control about when it's released at all in case she wants you know, they need drones. Does she have control over whether or not- She does. Drones? Okay. She does. And the mechanism is when she feels with her front legs, if the cell is small, she releases sperm. Okay. And if it's large, she doesn't release any. And that way they get, the drones get laid in the larger cells. An interesting point about how much sperm is released, when a, a freshly mated queen is gonna maybe release as many as 20 or 30 sperm for each egg, but as she like kind of gets a rhythm, she'll only release one or two sperm for each egg. But she's got enough eggs and enough sperm to last her whole lifetime. You'll 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 hear, oh, this queen is old and she's not laying well because she ran out of sperm. No queen ever ran out of sperm. Six million is more than enough to go for many, many, many years. Now the sperm may not all be viable, but she technically does not run out of sperm. So she's done. Right. Is 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 there any theory about why more honey is produced when there are more drones? You were talking about that, and I was just I found that really fascinating. Did, is there I any theory? The the theory that Dilly Allen puts out in her paper is that they are able to work more efficiently in some way, and that's why um, they they do have this drive to raise drones, and so you know maybe. It's like when all is well, you know, maybe they just work better together. The a bigger colony rate, you know, if you have a colony of 20,000 bees and one beside it with 20, and then you have one beside that with 40,000 bees, the theory used to be that maybe the, the 20, each one with 20,000 bees would make like, I'm making up these numbers, 10 pounds of honey each, then the one with 40 should make 20 pounds of honey, but the one with 40 will make much more. So a larger colony, makes a lot more honey than half of that twice again. So it could just do with thriving and being able to grow larger 
um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a mystery, but there is something to, you know, we have to, I don't, I'm not that woo woo, but I think we have to honor the bees natural rhythms and their natural instincts. Um, you know, sometimes we're just so skewed towards honey production. We don't sort of like trust them to do what they need to do. And th this is certainly a, a, not a cut and dry issue about how much energy they can on drones. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, you, you said that the drones have a great, much greater capacity to um, smell. Mm -hmm. Is that part of that whole mechanism maybe, or is there any thought on that or? I don't know, because I don't know what they, you know, we, we know that they really don't do anything in the NAS, in the NAS besides huh. heat, so. Well, and you had said the cells are larger, so then there would be maybe bigger cells to point. make the... Yes, and I, I do a lot of foundationless, and I'll notice that in over the years, in the spring, when I put an empty box on early, they'll make, they'll raise a whole round of drones, and then all of those large cells are used for honey, and it's more efficient storage, so that's a really good point, Debbie. That might have something to do with it. Wow. Um, I know this isn't uh, like a bee chat, but... Um, if you don't mind, from my understanding about the uh, drone uh, hive with more drones producing more, I've always heard morale, morale yeah. of the hive that yeah. has the proper balance of drones versus workers yes. is much higher. You know, the, it, it, when they don't have the drones, the bees get edgy, they yeah. get nervous, you know, just like a, a hive without a queen, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the disposition of the bee actually changes uh, and I run foundationless a lot as well. And I also run drone comb. Uh, I do a lot of queens. So drones awesome. are my thing. And that's why I was excited to, for your, for your, your own coming here tonight. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always heard that the morale of the hive is much higher when the, when the proportion of drones versus worker versus I have a solid queen is a much friendlier morale. Yeah. Yeah, let them do it, work it out. Absolutely. Because it's right. much frustrating for them when it's getting cold or when they don't have room to lay down. So that's that morale is a good word. I like that. So Francis asked, could a poorly mated queen run out of sperm? If she's poorly mated, so the spermatheca can hold six million sperm and a single drone has three to 11 million. So chances are she's not going to run out, but a poorly mated queen is going to be superseded or just die before she could possibly run out of sperm anyway, because the colony is going to be unhealthy and it's not going to thrive. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say about that. Hmm. Is there any theory about why it takes quite a bit longer for drones to develop? Um, not that I recall. Drones are raised much earlier than queens. And that's, I think that's true in other species, like the males are raised first. And that way when the queens come on the scene, they can be assured to have males to mate with. But um, the size, I don't know. It, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that the queen, the thing about the queen is most important. So if they need a new queen, they have to make her fast, you know? So it could have evolved in that. It's like, the shortest occupation time is the most important bee. Then the, the workers are a little more important and their occupation time is shorter than the drones. But I don't really know. And then they're bigger. They need to be bigger. It just takes more time. But the queen's bigger too. So I don't know. it's a good thing to prove mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, have, I have a question. Um, characteristics of the hive. They, and again, this is all hearsay. I, I have no 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 evidence to back up anything. I've always heard that the, 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 um, the defensiveness of the, the defensiveness of the, the bees comes from the drone. Comes from the drone. Yeah. You know, okay. you, it, 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 it and, and, and one of the, one of the, one of the reasons, you know, it's always been disregarded is because no one's ever been stung by a drone. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got a net, if you got a drone, that's really nasty. It, you don't know it because they can't sting you uh, but i've always heard they don't, they don't come at you or anything either you know? yeah but one thing that is that i have noticed flying my uav is they act i believe it looks very defensive when they fly at that thing and they're 
aggressive, they come at it fast. And when they're, it's like 20 feet below, there's a potential queen, but a big faction of them is up like bomb, dive bombing that UAV, which I find fascinating. I've been trying to think of a way to study it. And um, I actually found some small kites that are the exact size of birds of prey, like uh, hawks. And um, I've been trying to order one. They, they make them on these poles with the strings and can help launch it. And I think it'd be really interesting to see. I mean, we don't know, maybe they're up there dive bombing birds. You know, maybe it's a defensive behavior that they only exhibit when they're out of the nest, you know, like protecting their brothers or protecting the queen. I mean, it's kind of a, a suicidal attempt, but um, in fact, when I, those videos with the trap, I was trapping drones for a study. And what I really, I, I spent the whole winter building these traps that my UAV could tow, but it never worked because half the bees were up dive bombing the UAV and not at the trap and they could be attracted to the motor some people have said maybe the noise or there's magnetism around it but but whatever they're attracted to their behavior feels just from watching videos defensive so I think there's wouldn't some it, wouldn't it, I, it seems to me that it would make total sense for them to attack birds right because I'm if, glad you think so I think so I mean it, I mean, it, if, it, if, because, not, but Mm -hmm. It it would be it would be um, what is the word um, self sacrificing, yes. but it would it would protect the queen if they like if a bird is flying because that's you always hear that's another thing you always hear is that my queen didn't come back from mating, um, so it would make to me it would make perfect sense. Right, right. Well, Kirk says at the University of we have an idea that they can control the temperament of their bees by making sure that they're only drones from the more gentle colonies. I mean, that's that's just basic genetics, right? It's like you want a queen from a gentle colony, but you also want the drones from the gentle colony. You take drones from from tele aggressive colonies, and they're going to bring those aggressive genetics to the to the new colony. So that for sure, you have to select for the same traits in your drone right colonies for your bird breeding as you do for your queen colonies, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you cover, did you cover, I, I apologize, I, I came in late because my uh, my son had karate, um, but did you cover how far drones fly versus how far queens fly? Yeah, the drones fly shorter distances. Sure, than okay. The queens, and they, the drones also fly at a higher uh, altitude when they leave the nest, and they, they fly about 25 meters above ground. And then they get to the DCA, they'll go up to 400 feet, where the queens fly about eight meters, and the difference in height keeps inbreeding down. And then the fact that the queens will go farther, they can afford to expend more energy, because once they get to a DCA, there's going to be plenty of drones to mate with, and it takes a second for them to mate. And where the drones are, chances are they're not going to get lucky, so they're going to be going back and forth a lot more. So, I used to have a, I had a little graphic, and I used to say it was a third of a mile for the drones and a mile for the queens. But it really depends on the saturation of bees in your area, how far they fly. So it can be as as close as you know, three or five hundred feet, or it could be you know they've done there was a study done where they found an isolated area and they found that both the drones and the Queens would fly ten, flew ten miles, and only like three out of ten queens came back mated. But they they will fly farther if they have to. But mm -hmm. the um, it really did the how close they are depends how well saturated the area is. There, okay. Jersey Boyke says if you're if you're putting out drone colonies, you should saturate the area radius of 0.77 miles from your queen rent colonies. And Larry Connor says two miles. So the idea is just to saturate the area around your queen rate colonies as much as you can in a circle, and you can't always do that. But, um. Yeah, I have a I have I have a fellow AP air, uh, beekeeper about two miles away, and we we always joked that my queens mate with his drones, and his drones mate with my queens. <laughs> we, we both run drone comb, and we both run, and we both have very we're not the same genetics, we're similar genetics, but you know we we're, we're we're shooting for the same goal as far as gentleness and of row resistance. Nice. That's good when that works out. So if no one has any other questions, then um, I have one more, but I'm gonna 
defer this to a post-meeting conversation with you, Julia, because I think one of the things I mentioned in my introduction was that you do work with prisons in the Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. I, there's a lot to talk about on that, and I think we've kind of extended our, overgone our, over our time here. So I'm going to invite you back at a later time to talk to us about your work with prisons in the Atlantic, because I think that's something that we should all know about and maybe even get involved with. And sure. I think you'll be a good guide on that. So yeah. I'm going to thank you very much and everybody else for your questions and your attention. And yeah, thanks for the great questions and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Y'all have a good night. Thank you, Julia. Night. Okay. Thank you. Night.